Lastly, Echoes. So really glad that you can join us. We're just gonna give maybe a minute or so for other people to finish logging on. It takes a little time to register, I know. So we'll just give them another minute or so, then I'll go ahead and get started. But hope that everybody's having a, a good start to the new year. We're all hopeful it'll be a better year. Mm. And the surge will be over soon. I hope. Yes. Oh, I see all kinds of friendly faces, not faces actually, names on the um, participant list. And it's always good when I see you guys too. If you don't mind sharing your videos, we can say hello to you. Wave hello. <laughs> Okay, we have a bunch of our, hey. John, were you trying to tell me something? Oh, that was someone else. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead. We have a lot of slides, a lot of great content, great speaker. So we'll go ahead and get started. But anyway, so these are just the intro slides. Welcome to Project Echo. If you haven't attended before, it's free CME, distance technology, online learning. We can discuss cases. I'm sure you have really great challenging cases and questions. Um, we have interdisciplinary expertise. We have a community of learning that we are developing. Next slide. So yeah, please share your cases. We love challenging cases. That's why we're here. So please share. And then, you know, of course you have answers as well as not just us um, in the hub team. So we all feel free to chime in, use the chat box, unmute yourself. Next slide. And just a reminder that, um, you know, we want to safeguard confidentiality. Anytime we share patient information, it's got to be HIPAA compliant. This is also a safe learning environment. We don't want to make anybody confused or embarrassed, or we just want to encourage everybody to share and create a safe place for learning. A reminder that, echo, oops, go back, John. Echo consultations do not create or otherwise establish provider patient relationships. This is not a consult. This is just education. Next slide. And also a reminder that you can get CME. So um, when you registered, that's part of the story there. And then uh, at the, towards the end, uh, we will be posting a link to complete evaluation. When you complete that evaluation, you will get your CMEs. Next slide. And of course, you all know about Zoom already, but in case you don't, there's a chat box at the bottom that you can uh, click on. And we really want you to uh, put in your uh, comments and questions. And there's also a mute button that we have to make sure you mute to make when you're not speaking. Otherwise, we hear extraneous noise and cell phones and whatnot. And of course, we want you to use it. Um, I just want to remind you, please put your name and uh, where you're from in the chat box as part of our way of taking attendance. And as usual, um, ECHO, um, we have a hub team. There includes myself. I'm the course director for the Geriatrics ECHO Clinic. Let me know if you have any topics that uh, you would like to hear about. We have Mary Gottam. Wave hello. Hi, hi. Mary Kai, she is a currently retired Hawaii Department of Health public health nurse with lots of years of experience in the public health realm. Um, and unfortunately, our other hub team members are not able to join us today. Next slide. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Fei Gao. And she very kindly uh, provided her own introduction uh, on the slide. So John, if you could put up her slides, that would be awesome. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna actually share my own screen and see my own slides. Okay. Can everybody see the title slide? And get my share. So um, this is my introduction. Um, I am at Queens um, Medical Clinic Health Care Institute. Um, Sorry, can you speak into maybe a little bit closer? Oh, how's that? Is that better? So I I joined the Queens Neurology Group back in August. Um, I actually am from the East Coast. I do 
Pardon, boss. And then went on to complete a fellowship in movement disorders at UCSF. I don't have any financial disclosures. Okay. Sorry, Faye, you're cutting in and out. I don't know if there's a way or if you need to call in separately on a phone line. Oh, okay. Is it is it really bad or is it just intermittent? It's intermittent pretty bad. Uh, are you speaking? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm hearing you. All right, yeah, I'm, I can uh, I can call in on a phone line if John, if you could give me a number to call to. On your registration link, there should be a phone number. Let me check. Anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to have people think about all their patients with orthostatic hypotension and all the challenges they face, both medical and uh, even uh, challenges with um, daily life and how do we uh, work around those things. Anybody have good orthostatic hypotension cases? All right, Faith, let us know when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, is that better than it was before? I think so. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. It was working when we did the test run. Um, okay, well, I I was um I'm I'm very pleased to be joining you guys today. I was asked by Aida to uh, give this talk actually after we um, had discussed a very complex patient, a mutual patient of ours, with a neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, I'm sure it's a topic you've seen many many times in many of your patients. Um, so this is. You know, this is not by any means meant to be, you know, a super comprehensive and detailed talk. Um, but I do hope to give a review, um, kind of starting from the pathophysiology to differential to hopefully new strategies and um, management. Okay. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. We're going to start with a clinical case. This is a real case um, that I saw very recently. So uh, an 84-year-old Japanese man who lives on the Big Island was actually transferred to the Queen's ER for recurrent syncope. Over the past six months, he's had recurrent episodes of dizziness, usually after standing or while on the toilet. Um, and three of these episodes actually did lead to loss of consciousness for several minutes followed by prolonged confusion upon awakening. And after this last episode, um, he was seen by a cardiologist who um, was concerned about a high degree AV block and actually referred him urgently to Queens for admission. Um, upon review of systems, he has um, a couple of additional interesting symptoms over the past six months. He's also complained of gradual imbalance, constipation, frequent nighttime awakening to go to the bathroom, as well as a depressed mood. Um, and his granddaughter states that his speech has been soft. Uh, his past medical history is notable for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, iron deficiency, and osteoporosis. And he is on a number of medications, um, probably you know less, less than average for the number of medications you see in the geriatric population, but they include aspirin, a couple of um, antihypertensives, um, and then various other uh, preventative medications and um, supplements. Okay, so on initial exam, um, these are his supine and standing blood pressures. 
Uh, just take note that this is after he's already received some IV fluids in the ER, um, but you know, take a look. Uh, his neuro exam, um, he's fully oriented and language is good. You do notice some soft speech and reduced facial expressions, a little bit of stiffness and slowness um, and unsteadiness when he's walking. So some hypothetical questions, what do you do next? What do, you, what do you think is going on and how would you manage? Um, so feel free to kind of enter in some thoughts into the chat. We'll return back to this at the end of, of my talk. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly review normal blood pressure control to, um, to orthostatic changes. So normally when a healthy individual stands up, there is immediate gravitational pooling of venous blood, typically in the kind of the lower abdomen and then the upper legs, that can be up to a liter. Um, most of this occurs in the first 10 seconds, but can actually continue pooling down um, in over the course of three to five minutes of standing. And because of this, there's reduced uh, venous return to the heart, the atrial pressure falls to zero, stroke volume is reduced, and there's a reduction in cardiac output of about 20%. Um, our bodies have developed a compensatory response to prevent us from passing out, and that's the baroreflex um, response. So the baroreceptors in the aortic arch and the carotid sinuses detect this fall in blood pressure, um, and through, um, through this complex um, autonomic reflex, um, there is increase in sympathetic tone, which leads to vasoconstriction of the peripheral arteries, as well as an increase in heart rate and cardiac contractility. And there's also a reduction in parasympathetic tone, um, which helps the heart to increase heart rate and contractility. Um, and that allows for a compensatory increase in cardiac output and maintenance of peripheral blood pressure. So the autonomic um, arc is uh, coordinated through both the central autonomic network and the peripheral autonomic uh, system, which is divided into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic uh, systems. Um, and there's, there's two pathways, the afferent pathway and the efferent pathway. The afferent pathway involves the baroreceptors sensing the fall in blood pressure. Um, and through, um, uh, through the vagal and the glossopharyngeal nerves, there's reduced impulses to the nucleus tractus solitarius, this um, kind of purple nucleus within the dorsal medial medulla. And then there's this central regulation pathway, which uh, is super complicated, involves all these structures, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the insula, the pons, uh, the brachial, parabrachial brachial complex in the pons, as well as the periaqueductal gray matter. We're not gonna review all of this, um, but then essentially it moves towards the efferent pathway, which is mediated by the nucleus tractus solitarius. So the sympathetic branch is, um, is through the uh, CVLM, the caudal ventrolateral medulla. Basically this pathway leads to um, a stimulation of the preganglionic spinal cord centers, which then synapse to these post-ganglionic neurons um, in the sympathetic chain. And, and then these are what um, uh, stimulate the heart to increase contractility and the sinus node to increase heart rate, as well as to the peripheral arterial beds um, through catecholamine release to vasoconstrict. The nucleus tra tractus solitarius also mediates um, basically inhibition of the nucleus ambiguous, which is what sends impulses through the vagus nerve. And if you recall, the vagus nerve slows down the heart rate. So inhibition of this parasympathetic uh, pathway uh, will increase heart rate. Okay, all right, that's enough uh, neuroanatomy. So what happens when this system doesn't work well? Okay, so Orthostatic hypotension is defined as a sustained drop in blood pressure after a postural change. Um, there are three types. Uh, we're gonna focus on the first type. That's kind of what we commonly think of, the classical OH, which is a sustained blood pressure drop 
um, over 20 millimeters of mercury in the systolic or 10 millimeters of mercury in the diastolic within the first three minutes of standing. Um, there is an increasingly recognized um, pathology called delayed OH, which is where the, um, the drop actually occurs after three minutes of standing. This may also cause a lot of debilitating symptoms to patients, but not be caught because we're not commonly taking blood pressures you know, that long after patients stand up. And then finally, there's the kind of more benign um, type of OH, which is initial OH. So initial OH is a transient blood pressure drop. And notice how there are higher thresholds for definition that occurs um, only in the first 15 minutes of active standing. So this is when somebody goes from sitting to standing very, very quickly. Um, whereas if they do it slowly, like on a passive tilt table test, um, there is no blood pressure drop. So as a, uh, per definition, it resolves. Um, it usually occurs in younger patients and it's not associated with disease or morbidity. And here are three tilt table test results that kind of depict um, uh, the, the fall in blood pressure um, in patients with these three types of OH. So the classical OH up here, this is what we're gonna focus on. You can see the blood pressure um, values here in blue, this range between the diastolic and systolic. And then pretty gradually over the course of like the first two minutes, you see this darkest drop. But notice how actually the blood pressure keeps falling even up to 10 minutes after standing. In delayed OH, this person, they maintain their systolic and blood and diastolic blood pressure kind of up to about eight to 10 minutes, and then it starts falling. So this is quite interesting here. And then this picture shows initial OH. Um, on the left graph here, this is the person actively standing. So they have this very quick drop, like just within the first 15 seconds that immediately corrects itself. But when the same person is passively elevated or tilted up, there is no drop. So this may may not necessarily be pathological. Okay, so uh, so orthostatic hypotension um, is a very very prevalent um, uh, problem, especially in the elderly. There's no consensus on exact figures, but um, various different population studies um, give estimates of 20 to 30 percent. In middle-aged patients, it's a lot lower, about 5%. Um, and it's associated with a lot of cardiac, neurologic, metabolic disorders, as well as with increased mortality and morbidity. Common symptoms, you know, the lightheadedness, the dizziness, the pre-syncope, and then of course the syncope where there's not enough blood, uh, blood flow to sustain um, brain function. Now, some patients can have none of those symptoms and present with um, gait instability or blur vision or nausea or even co confusion cognitive changes. Um, there's also a phenomenon where patients can have neck and shoulder pain described as kind of like a coat hanger headache. This is thought to be due to hypoperfusion of the shoulder girdle muscles. And then there are some patients who have orthostatic hypotension but are completely asymptomatic, even at very low systolic blood pressures. Um, and this is thought to be due to a successful cerebral autoregulation. Um, so this, you know, this may distinguish certain patients and we don't really quite you know, understand or are able to predict who will be symptomatic and who won't. And then long-term patients with um, uncontrolled severe um, chronic orthostatic hypotension uh, may actually have developed dementia because of chronic hypoperfusion of the brain. Um, so orthostatic hypotension, essentially there's uh, insufficient compensatory response. And there's two kind of uh, mechanisms that mediate it, either reduced cardiac output, um, the kind of most common sort of scenario in that is people who have um, hypovolemia, or um, if they have insufficient intravascular reserve, um, they're already at maximum peripheral vascular resistance, and they can't increase that any further um, to compensate for an ortho orthostatic stress. Or people with primary cardiac 
disorders um, where uh, they can't respond to sympathetic modulation. The other mechanism is decreased peripheral uh, vascular resistance. So people who are on medications that inhibit sympathetic tone or people who have a failure of the autonomic system function. And that's really where we define neurogenic OH as opposed to all the other causes, which are kind of lumped into this category of non-neurogenic OH. Um, yep, so neurogenic OH is caused by impairment of the baroreflex mediated vasoconstriction of the peripheral circulation. Um, so I, you know, neurologists always like to localize. So in this case, we localize based on whether the disturbance is in the central autonomic pathways with intact peripheral innervation or peripherally mediated, uh, which is loss or dysfunction of the peripheral noradrenergic fibers. Um, so going back to that little diagram, we have, um, you know, everything brain and spinal cord central and then everything um, uh, kind of post-ganglionic or at the end organ peripheral. So this is not a full and detailed list, but um, kind of a, a listing of the most common causes of the neurogenic um, orthostatic hypertension. And um, in addition to kind of categorizing by central versus peripheral, I also like to kind of think of them and group them in sort of like etiologic um, categories. So basically the three big categories would be the neurodegenerative um, alpha-synucleinopathies. Then we have the um, brainstem and spinal cord pathology, which could be metabolic or structural. Um, and then we have the autonomic neuropathies. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the neurodegenerative um, and then I'll do kind of a quick review of the autonomic neuropathies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the brainstem and spinal cord, um, just because in our demographic, I think we're going to be seeing mostly the, the former two. Okay, so that, the degenerative um, disorders um, with uh, alpha synucleinopathies. These are disorders that cause, uh, that involve the abnormal intracellular deposition and aggregation of alpha synuclein within the nervous system. Um, and these cause these very distinct pathologic bodies called Lewy bodies. And you can see this nice picture here in a substantia nigra cell. So these dark little inclusions are melanin. And this kind of big circular eosinophilic core with a bright halo over it, this is a Lewy body. This is full of alpha synuclein. And patients with, um, with alpha synuclein, um, the alpha synucleinopathy um, associated autonomic failure um, almost always have neurogenic OH. It's a, it's a significant symptom in all of them. Um, and they often have a lot of other symptoms of autonomic dysfunction as well, including postprandial hypotension, supine hypertension, and then impairment in GI, urogenital function, and thermoregulation. Um, and then in addition to, to occurring in the central nervous system, Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein also occur in the peripheral system. So here is actually an example of a Lewy body, a little, a little misshapen, um, but this is a Lewy body in the sympathetic nerve. So, the kind of classic um, alpha synucleinopathy causing NOH is multiple systems atrophy. So MSA is centrally mediated. Um, the neurodegeneration sort of centralizes in the pons and the cerebellum, but also and also includes severe progressive autonomic failure. Um, typically, these patients have Parkinsonism, but with very poor levodopa responsiveness as well as cerebellar signs like early postural instability and ataxia. And up to 75% of patients do have premotor central symptoms, both including NOH and constipation urinary symptoms, and also sleep disorders, most commonly REM sleep behavior disorder and sleep apnea. Um, diagnosis is clinical. There are a set of criteria um, to fulfill, but some, uh, 
corroborative testing may show cerebellar and pontine atrophy on MRI. And here you see a kind of a classic hot cross bun sign where you see kind of T2 hyperintense cross in the pons. And you can also see that this patient has some um, sort of more pronounced cerebellar um, folia, which indicate atrophy. I do want to say that the hot cross bun sign is not pathognomonic for MSA. It's a nonspecific sign that can occur in any um, cerebellar trophic disorder. The NOH um, in MSA is preganglionic and central. So that means any tests that look at postganglionic function, like an MIBG scan and a cardiac PET, which we'll talk about later, will be normal. So contrast this with Parkinson's disease. PD is the most common alpha synuclinopathy, um, and it, it involves both central and peripheral nervous system. Um, the clinical features are you know, the classic unilateral resting tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, but up to 50% up to of these patients do have early autonomic symptoms, including NOH. Um, usually their motor symptoms are very responsive to levodopa, but this actually can exacerbate the NOH, so we have to be very careful here. Um, Diagnosis is again clinical, but um, some testing modalities that can help if you're unsure is a uh, positive DAT scan. So a dopamine um, a reuptake transport scan. Um, so here on the left, you see a normal DAT scan showing really you know, avid uptake in the cauda imputamen, which is where the dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra project to. And on the right here, you see kind of the, the loss of the uptake changing almost the shape um, and also the, the color. So this patient also has asymmetric uptake, asymmetrically reduced uptake. Um, there's also some MRI signs which are nonspecific and I, I don't really use that as a diagnostic um, tool that, that commonly. Um, uh, but there is this new sign called the loss of swallowtail that shows changes in the substantia nigra. So contrasted to MSA, the, the NOH in Parkinson's is postganglionic, so it's actually um, peripheral. So MIBG scan um, of the heart will actually be positive. Um, Dementia with Lewy bodies, DLB, um, it's the second most common neurodegenerative dementia after Alzheimer's. Um, you're probably very familiar with these patients. They, um, they are oftentimes demented, have been um, you know, possibly previously diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, but they have some characteristics that look quite atypical, including the hallucinations, the fluctuating alertness, and then the really the poor responsiveness to neuroleptics as well as to levodopa. And patients with DLAB also tend to have more autonomic dysfunction than PD. And actually that's one of the kind of red flags, consider one of the red flag signs for considering DLB over PD um, as sometimes they can present very similarly. Um, patients with DLB also have postganglionic NOH. Um, their DAT scan may, may be positive, and their MRIs could show diffuse cortical atrophy posteriorly. Okay, finally, this is one disorder that um, kind of commonly missed, um, per, pure autonomic failure. So pure autonomic failure um, is an alpha synuclinopathy purely of the peripheral autonomic um, system. So there's no central involvement at all. So these patients pretty much have all those signs of autonomic failure that you might see in MSA, but they shouldn't have any motor signs. They shouldn't have any cognitive impairment, you know, really no central symptoms. Um, it's thought, however, that up to 30% of people who look like they have PAF are really experiencing sort of that premotor phase of MSA or Parkinson's, and then may actually end up converting to a central alpha synucleinopathy. Um, so diagnosis and testing um, will be fairly similar to that of Parkinson's and DLB. There is postganglionic sympathetic denervation, um, and they may have also decreased norepinephrine plasma concentration. Okay. 
very briefly moving on to the autonomic neuropathies. So this is a very heterogeneous group of disorders that involve the, the injury of small and unmyelinated autonomic fibers. Common symptoms that these patients experience are NOH, heart rate abnormalities, impaired thermoregulation, pupillary dysfunction, um, including tonic pupils, um, reduced GI transit, urogenital symptoms, as well as pseudomotor abnormalities. So these are sweat abnormalities. And these are kind of the big categories. Um, I'll go through each one. Diabetic is really number one, two, and three. So diabetic autonomic neuropathy is the most common autonomic neuropathy in the world. And patients who have autonomic symptoms have increased mortality and morbidity compared to those who don't. There's several different types of syndrome of autonomic failure, which even which adds even further to the complexity. Um, there is the autonomic neuropathy that is generalized, occurring in, typically in patients with pretty poor um, glycemic control, so very high A1Cs. But there's also autonomic neuropathy that occurs in a pre-diabetic state. And then even more kind of discouragingly, um, autonomic neuropathy that happens when patients are treated and their A1C is brought down very rapidly. Um, and then finally, patients who have um, quite difficult control, who are often hypoglycemic, um, can also experience autonomic neuropathy from that too. Um, and the symptoms are often really quite um, debilitating to patients, and, and they may not necessarily complain of them um, to doctors, but the, the GI symptoms tend to be the worst. So gastroparesis is quite common. Um, some patients may have constipation, whereas others have diarrhea and fecal incontinence. Bladder dysfunction is huge, as is erectile dysfunction. Um, and then finally, the, the pseudomotor dysfunction impaired sweat. Okay, next I do want to touch on amyloid. Amyloidosis is um, kind of an under-recognized cause of peripheral neuropathy in general, but then also a, a big cause of autonomic neuropathy. About 65% of people with um, AL amyloidosis, that's the primary most common form. And then 75% with the transthyretin form of amyloidosis can have autonomic dysfunction. Um, and this is important because um, it is now potentially treatable. There have been actually um, new agents on the market, um, autonom uh, sorry, monoclonal antibodies targeted against the amyloid proteins, depending on, on the type that patients have, that can potentially treat their symptoms. Um, so I think, uh, I think we're going to be kind of pushing for expanded testing for amyloid. Then there are the immune mediated autonomic neuropathies. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of the interesting ones on here to note, um, the Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome can, can lead to autonomic neuropathy. And that's not commonly seen in myasthenia. Neuropathy due to celiac disease. Also, it's rare, but um, under-recognized. I think there are a lot of people who are undiagnosed who do have this. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, the acute form of the inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy can present with really severe um, orthostatic uh, and um, hypertensive control issues early on. Okay, hereditary uh, autonomic neuropathy, not really going to go through them. This is not our target demographic, but good to know that they exist. And then the sort of miscellaneous, um, infectious, um, botulism, HIV, and then toxin-mediated. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, one of the uh, kind of rare but... Um, a stark toxins that can cause an acute autonomic neuropathy is the box jellyfish, uh, which is also described as the world's most venomous marine animal um, in which we are unknowingly um, potentially exposed to. Um, but yes, uh, all jokes aside, alcohol and chemotherapy um, are big causes of autonomic neuropathy in addition to the sensory, painful sensory neuropathy that's more commonly um, known. Okay, so um, really briefly, diagnosis and evaluation. 
So the key here is that you want to take supine or sitting blood pressures and then standing blood pressures three minutes after standing. So this is something that I myself am very guilty of. I don't, I oftentimes don't wait the full three minutes, but if you take the blood pressure, you know, too quickly, you may not account for the full dramatic fall that happens three minutes or even five, eight minutes after patients stand. So I, I think it is useful to um, be a little bit more diligent about our practice. You know, we can take the standing blood pressure immediately after standing, but then I would wait and have the patient stay standing for the full three minutes and then take it again. The, once you diagnose the OH, um, the first and the most important step is to exclude all those non-neurogenic causes. And I guarantee every patient that you have with NOH probably also has these other causes, the drugs, metabolic disturbances, and any other reasons for reduced cardiac output. Um, cardiac testing is often undertaken as sort of the first um, ancillary uh, or set of ancillary tests. And I, I don't think this is inappropriate. I think a lot of patients do require testing and an EKG to start with, plus any type of stress testing or structural heart visualization um, is very much a good idea, especially in geriatric populations. So these are the medications. It's not a full list, but these are the big culprits. Um, and I think we're all very familiar with them. Um, we often prescribe them. Um, we often use them and they, they have you know, very good uses in a lot of our patients but we always need to review the medication list um, and see if these are absolutely necessary or if we can take them off. Um, and then we also should check for the conditions that um, exacerbate OH, like endocrine abnormalities, um, any potential sources of intravascular volume depletion, and then screen for physical a level of physical exercise um, because deconditioning is a huge one here. Okay, so okay, so assuming you've done all of this and patient still has signs and symptoms of NOH, but you're not quite sure, what can you do? So there's a range of autonomic testing that can be done to kind of um, provide more information and um, really definitively diagnose barrel reflex failure. Um, the one that's kind of most commonly done and most useful is the head up tilt table test. Um, many of you may be familiar with this. Um, essentially a patient is strapped to a table in a supine position and through a motor, they're slowly elevated up to upright. And then that's maintained for several minutes. And then over the course of this change, um, the uh, monitor can check the blood pressure and heart rate like, almost continuously. And the, the really good benefit of this is obviously the accurate measurements and also protecting a patient from falling um, once they're at the upright position. So the previous slides that I showed with the um, illustrations of classical OH, NOH and um, uh, delayed, et cetera, those were all taken from tilt table tests. Another test that can be done is a quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test, which looks for sweating. So sweating is axonally mediated through the pseudomotor axons um, and a, a good measure of um, postganglionic um, uh, sympathetic activity. I won't go through this too, too much, but the idea is that there's these capsules that are attached to the patient's skin, and they're linked to a gas chamber that controls humidity levels and detects changes in humidity. And then there's this box that sends stimulation to nearby and then also secretes a small amount of acetylcholine. And that's supposed to stimulate the axons to producing sweat. Um, and the amount of sweat will change the humidity levels um, and then those can be detected and graphed. The other easier way to look at sweating function is through the thermoregulatory sweat test. So in this test, patient is, the uh, whole body is covered in a yellow dye um, and then they're placed into a chamber where the temperature is slowly raised. And then as the 
uh, as the person sweats, the dye will actually change color from yellow to purple. So a, a, a lack of sweat can be detected by basically the patient's color after you've reached a certain, um, certain temperature. And different autonomic disorders have different patterns and, and levels of not abnormal sweating. Um, additional testing that can be done, these are optional and really geared towards the patient's, you know, each individual symptoms and signs. Um, you know, first of all, a peripheral neuropathy evaluation is indicated, including potentially a biopsy. Um, there, again, the MIBG um, scintigraphy scan. So this is a nuclear scan that um, often is used for pheochromocytomas, but can also be used to uh, distinguish between postganglionic versus preganglionic sympathetic neuronal loss. Um, so this is a picture of an MIBG scan where the left, there's normal uptake in the heart relative to the mediastinum. And then on the right, this patient has um, a, a lack of uptake in the heart. So this may be diagnostic of, of a postganglionic um, a sympathetic denervation such as seen in Parkinson's. Um, but would not be seen in somebody with MSA. Okay, treatment. So treatment um, is recommended when symptoms lead to a decline in a patient's quality of life or pose a risk to their health or safety. So I don't routinely treat patients with asymptomatic um, orthostatic hypertension. So that, that's kind of my big takeaway point here. And really the, the first line and even second and third line treatments are all about those um, medication review and comorbid condition um, screening, as well as non-pharmacologic strategies to, um, to improve their symptoms. Pharmacologic options are typically reserved really for when the non-pharmacologic strategies fail. Um, and some of these strategies um, include increasing volume. And that's probably the biggest one. A lot of these patients are, are, are dehydrated or not drinking a lot, whether it's due to um, uh, reduced access to water or whether it's due to other symptoms that kind of um, force them or um, encourage them not to drink, like the frequent urination. Um, strategies to increase peripheral resistance include um, compression stockings, I won't review the compression stockings too, too much because patients really do hate them. And there's sort of mixed quality evidence that supports their use, but I, I do encourage it to people who can tolerate them. And then performing leg and fist pumping exercises, this kind of helps to reduce that venous pooling before people stand up. Physical exercise to reduce um, deconditioning, elevating the head of the blood, head of bed um, at night while sleeping. And again, the other additional lifestyle modifications to change patients' habits. All right, when these fail, then we move on to pharmacologic therapy. Um, first line treatment, um, kind of the, the, the quickest, easiest one to go to is midodrine. So this is a short acting alpha agonist, which leads to vasoconstriction. Um, it works pretty well, um, but it does have the adverse effect of supine hypertension. So the, the recommendation for using this is to, um, you know, to take it frequently throughout the day, but then um, avoid the supine position after taking it for several hours. Fludrocortisone is often used. Um, this is essentially an analog of cortisol with a very strong mineralocorticoid and a weak glucocorticoid effect. Um, its main effect is to expand intravascular volume, but not, not to vasoconstrict. Um, the big danger of this is fluid overload, so it's advised to use with caution in patients with heart failure. Um, Droxidopa is now actually a first-line treatment for NOH. Um, there are very good analyses and um, clinical trials out there that actually show there is a reduction, a significant reduction in falls um, and other, other morbid morbidities in patients with NOH, although some studies do suggest that the benefits can drop over time. Um, 
Peridostigmine um, is often an agent I like to use. It's a non-depolarizing acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Um, and it basically amplifies um, both the afferent and the efferent limbs of the baroreflex pathway. Um, it also helps to soften stool, so that's a nice sort of two-in-one. Um, and small studies do show that there's a, a sizable improvement in, in blood pressure. Okay, uh, kind of a, another second line agent, adamoxetine or um, stratera. So this is a selective norepinephrine transporter blocker. Um, it's often used for ADHD, but it has been studied at lower doses for NOH um, and, and has pretty good results. Um, the only caveat with this is that it does require the person to have norepinephrine um, intact already uh, or still intact at some level. So um, it, it may be very good for preganglionic autonomic failure, but less so in postganglionic um, if the patient has really no sympathetic activity left. And then finally, there's um, sort of a handful of medications that can be used in certain scenarios. So for people who have anemia, um, epoidin can be used to try to expand the intracellular volume. Desmopressin can be used for patients with um, polyuria to uh, you know, help reduce their symptoms at night and then indirectly lead to you know, patient um, increasing their, uh, their intake. Octreotide and acarbose uh, can be given for postprandial hypotension. Um, and then theoretically, a non-selective beta blocker can also be used to inhibit vasodilation. Um, I'll be honest, I have, I have not actually used a non-selective beta blocker um, to treat patients, and I, I, I tend to stay away from that whole group of medications. Okay, I wanna spend just a quick um, moment talking about supine hypertension. This is a very common side effect of, of pretty much all of these treatments for NOH and can also occur due to the underlying disease pathology. Um, and it can be very scary and it can oftentimes lead us to sort of limit the aggressiveness of our regimen for NOH. Um, but, but I think it can be managed and the best management is, for, is non-pharmacologic. So um, I, I think the number one strategy is whenever using short-acting medications for NOH, really to ensure that the patients remain seated or standing. If they must lie down because they're non-ambulatory, um, they can lie down, but the head of the, the, head of the bed has to be elevated. Um, they really shouldn't be lying down except at night when they're sleeping. Um, and then they should try, try to revert to small frequent meals and snacks throughout the day to avoid the postprandial hypotension, which can then kind of uh, you know, lead to a bounce of uh, supine hypertension later. O only if, if absolutely necessary. So if patient is um, symptomatic, um, you can use short acting antihypertensives. The safest ones to use would probably be um, like Captopril, um, or nifedipine or um, uh, uh, nitroglycerin um, subcutaneous, uh, sorry, not subcutaneous, like the, the nitroglycerin patch or strip, um, just one dose before bedtime. Um, but even, even low doses of those can worsen the OH, the NOH in the morning. So these are kind of like last, last dish um, efforts. Okay. All right, I'm almost done. So um, going back to our, um, our original case presentation, um, I'm gonna just pull up the chat here and see if, uh, oh, okay. So I was hoping that people could enter in kind of some of their thoughts as we go. So this patient, remember this is an 84 year old uh, man from the big island who uh, was referred for syncope. So he did undergo a full cardiac workup in the hospital um, and he only had a first degree AV block and ended up not having um, any, any evidence of ischemic or valvular disease. Um, he, was, uh, uh, he did go for an MRI of his brain. And here I have um, his scans. On the left, we have a T2 axial, which it's not very prominent, but I think if you squint a little bit, 
you can kind of see these unusual striations in, in the midline sort of cross-secting the ponds. And then on the right side here, you have a T1 sagittal scan that I thought showed maybe a little bit more, um, uh, uh, a little prominence of the cerebellar folia. So what do you guys think is his diagnosis? Yeah, MSA. Okay, so I put MSA as my top. I said, it still could be Parkinson's disease. He's never tried carbidopa, levodopa. Um, and one of the criteria for diagnosing MSA is that um, they're not responsive to carbidopa, levodopa. Although in fact, all patients with atypical Parkinsonism can to a certain extent respond to levodopa. So. What did we end up doing for him? So the diltiazem and the hydralazine were stopped. Um, he was instructed to increase his water and salt intake. Lifestyle modifications were canceled in depth, including getting up slowly, pumping his legs, and sleeping with the head of bed elevated. We also added on aggressive bowel regimen and prescribed um, medication for um, overactive bladder. I did end up um, starting a very, very low dose of the carbidopa levodopa just to kind of see and test. Um, but I, I didn't go up beyond more than one tablet BID for kind of caution of, um, uh, of not worsening the neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And then on a follow-up, one month later, um, the patient reported doing much better. He had no more episodes of syncope. His dizziness was improved. Um, and his ambulation also improved with the levodopa and with use of a walker. So this was kind of a, kind of a good um, improvement. Okay, so take-home points. NOH is really common, very debilitating high prevalence in the elderly population. Clinical tools and ancillary testing can be very helpful for a diagnosis. Um, the big, you know, the big uh, emphasis on treatment is a multidisciplinary approach, often amongst the gerontologists, neurologists, and cardiologists, um, uh, with the emphasis on, on the identifying iatrogenic factors and lifestyle modifications. And unfortunately, you know, we often do use and we do have to use pharmacologic treatments uh, when the non-pharmacologic management fails, but they are often unsatisfactory and problematic. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that, I learned a lot. This is fantastic. We have about five minutes of time for questions. So if you guys wanna, uh, chat in the box or, you know, unmute yourself, then we're, we're ready to do that. I just want to just uh, can't overemphasize the fact that this really impacts quality of life and that it's important to give patients something they can control. So those non-pharmacologic strategies are something that they really hang their head on and really paying attention also to depression. Uh, because uh, this impacts really like they, they were able to be very active before they can no longer be as active and it's really rough. Um, so I'm just gonna open that up and see if anybody else has questions or comments on that. No need to be shy. Um, there is a, don't forget to click on the, the text, um, the chat box for the CMEs. Uh, I'm gonna ask you, uh, Faye, how often do you prescribe physical therapy? Um, I, I pretty much prescribe it in every patient that I see, unless, you know, unless there's a reason not to, unless they're extremely mobile and they already, have you know like a five six times a week exercise regimen that they do without any problems at all um, but I, I think everybody um, at least in the population of patients that I see can benefit from physical therapy 
Um, and it can be good, not just in the traditional sense to, um, you know, to create an exercise regimen, improve, you know, Parkinsonian symptoms, improve motor symptoms, um, but also to give strategies like the leg, pump, leg pumping exercises, like specific to treating NOH and also ways to reduce and prevent deconditioning because that's an extremely prevalent problem in our population, the deconditioning, right? And oftentimes that sort of turns into a vicious cycle where because they're deconditioned, you know, their family kind of give up on trying to convince them to go out and exercise. Then they have no chance to exercise. They have, um, they're sort of very much limited to their, their one space. So I, I think physical therapy is a really important way to break that cycle. I noticed there's a there's a several nurses actually on our call here, and I just want to give them an opportunity to comment if they want to say anything. Any comments from our nurses? <laughs> Uh, this is Mary. I'll just say that <clears throat> as a public health nurse, uh, the memories are kind of fading, but I, uh, I would have a lot of people who would, uh, you know, seem to have orthostatic uh, hypotension and would, would get injuries from falls a lot. And a lot of times we never did know what the cause of their, their dizziness and all was, but our focus was trying to make the environment as safe as possible. And like you said, um, encouraging them to, to ask their doctor for PT and things to try to keep them as strong as they could. And, and it was just, you know, really um, always sad and, and frustrating. We tried, so, you know, so hard to think all the little things that we could do to help keep them from, you know, falling backwards and cracking their skull or whatever, but, uh, um, that's what we did. We, we tried to find the little things we could do to make, make it safer and, and improve the quality of life for them. Yeah, home safety evaluation, right? Yay for the home safety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, try to make... Michael, yeah. yeah, the little subtle, the little subtle things we could, you know, try to do, like, like you said, the home safety, try to make changes to the environment, see what we, what all we could do to improve the quality of life for this senior. A lot of times they'd be living alone too. So it was uh, worrisome, you know, that if they fell and hit their head and nobody was there to know. So but tried all these different things. Great idea. Yeah, get those mm. personal emergency response systems. Yeah, the PERS. Yeah. Great. So mm. apologies. It's one o'clock. Wish we could keep talking. But it is one, and I want to give people a chance to sign off and get back to their clinics or wherever they're going. But thank you so much. Don't forget to do your evaluations. Uh, if you go onto the registration website, you can also find the evaluation link there. And Mikhail, the link isn't quite working. I tried to click on it. So... Okay, thank you everybody and hope to see you next month as well. Thanks so much, Dr. Gao. Appreciate it. Thank Your you. Overview, thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.